and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. It's hard to imagine that we're in the middle of the great fast. Today is the fourth Sunday of this great fast. And it's actually interesting that this gospel passage is read in the fourth Sunday of the Holy 50, but that's for different reasons. Um, last week, we talked about the prodigal son. But if you compare the prodigal son with today, you see big difference, differences between the two stories. Last week, we met someone who knew the right way and chose to leave. And maybe they returned some time later. And when he returned, he was criticized by his own brother. The Samaritan woman today was ignorant. She didn't search. She was not returning to Christ. He came to her. Today's passage is, is very powerful. The Samaritan woman, this one, this is one of the, the longest one-on-one um, -on -one interactions in all the gospel texts. And in dealing with the Samaritan woman patiently, we see a glimpse, a taste of the way that our Lord would unite the Jews and the Gentiles through his work and would give and would reconcile the Gentiles back to our living relationship with God. Our Lord Jesus Christ comes to sit near Jacob's well. And we're told that he's tired from his journey. And he saw the Samaritan woman at the well and he did something completely unexpected. He broke the social conventions and the ritual laws of purity by speaking to her. And he asks her for such a simple act, for a cup of water. And in doing so, he demonstrates some need. And he was actually opening her up and reeling her in for a conversation and an encounter that would change the rest of her life. The woman at the well, whom we know through tradition to know, be known as Saint Fotini, uh, did not understand what the Lord was doing, but only looked at the social conventions, the laws of the day. In other words, she replied to him saying, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? One of the most amazing things about the conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well is that it actually should never have happened in the first place. According to the customs, this was actually a scandalous event. The woman says as much when she says, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Because the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. She com is completely stunned by the behavior of Jesus. He has demonstrated that she is in fact a human being. Sure, she's not a Jew, but even though she's a Samaritan, he treats her with respect and asks her for a drink of water. One of the things that we forget oftentimes in our day and age, in our day-to-day -day lives, is that part of being a Christian is not just being a good person and going to church. One of the requirements for living the Christian life is the ability to love others, especially strangers. The Lord would have been justified in staying away from this woman and following the norms of the day. But with Jesus, we always see someone who is willing to break the mold, to go out of his way, to really get to know others, to interact with them, and above all, to love them. We often hold the idea that someone, for whatever reason, can be, is not worthy of our love. We find ways. For example, if they're a political opponent, we can withhold our love. If they're not of our race, we can withhold our love. If they're not of our religion, we can withhold our love. If we don't live, if they don't live in our neighborhood or go to our school or wear a certain quality of clothes, or, or behave a certain way or speak properly, then we can withhold our love. Our Lord Jesus Christ answered her with these lovely words. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, 
you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The Samaritan woman is still clearly confused. She is thinking about physical water, but our Lord is offering her something that is divine, something that is spiritual in nature. So after the, she questions the Lord again, he replies, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst forever. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. Everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. These are the words that our Lord Jesus Christ said to a thirsty, weary Samaritan woman. The woman was indeed thirsty for water, but the Lord found her to be thirsty for much more than water. She was lonely. She loved companionship. She needed to have a man around her at all times. She needed to feel love and she needed attention. Everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. These are the words that should come alive in each one of us in hearing these words. Water is the most important thing that a human being can consume, yet afterwards, we still need water again and again and again. Everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. The Lord makes these words meaningful because we understand that he's not speaking about H2O. He is speaking about the desires and the thirsts of our heart. We are continually searching for something to make us happy. We're constantly trying to find the thing that will bring us peace. For example, how does a man become an alcoholic? A man or a woman? No gender specific here. How does a person become an alcoholic? They're curious to see what one drink can do. And after this drink, they may find that they have a sense of peace or some kind of numbness that satisfies them for a few moments. Next time that they try to get that sensation, they start with a drink, but quickly adds more and more. And the body and the mind develop a tolerance. And that person needs to more to, needs to add more to get that same feeling. Finally, the thirst is so strong that they can't quench it. Even if they were swimming in a pool of a very strong drink, why? Because they, are, they have become hardwired for something greater. We are hard, hardwired for the infinite. No matter what we do, we find very few things that actually permanently bring us fulfillment. Some may try drinks. Some may engage in toxic relationships. Some try wealth. Some try riches. Others, new careers, new religions. But in each case, our Lord reminds us Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But the Lord continues. He says, Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst forever. The water that I shall give him will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The Lord tells us that he alone can quench the thirst. He alone can provide fulfillment. And the fulfillment is not conditional. It remains with us through the good times and the challenging times, through sickness, through tragedy, and even death. He is our living water. You can find fresh water in your well. So where is this well? It's in the heart of each one of us. And we fill it regularly with all sorts of things, but this type of water evaporates. And it never stays for long. But whatever the Lord gives us, it remains forever. It's an amazing promise. Read his words. Read his words daily in the Gospels. Read the scripture. Think of the, about them. Memorize them. And they will stay in your heart forever. In, in your heart forever. These don't evaporate. 
We have to pray fervently daily and develop a relationship with God, not superficial. Not only when we need something. Learn to, to weep and to shed tears while we ask for forgiveness and he will provide more water for the well in your heart. And this water is permanent. It never fades completely and it cleanses and it transforms whatever it touches. The human heart is a great puzzle. And some people spend their whole lives trying to arrange and to fill in the missing pieces. But we are hardwired for the infinite. There is a God-shaped hole in the heart of every man or woman or child. And the sooner in life that we learn to pursue God, the sooner that we will find peace and fulfillment and purpose and holiness. This is the promise. The sooner that we find this living water, the more we can share this water with others. So what is the water that our Lord is speaking about? What is this water that allows us to never thirst again and will become in us a spring that leads to eternal life? It's the Holy Spirit. St. Cyril says as much when he says, Jesus calls the quickening gift of the Spirit living water because mere human nature is parched to its very roots now rendered dry and barren of all virtue by the crimes of the devil. But now, human nature runs back to its pristine beauty and drinking in that which is life-giving. It is made beautiful with a variety of good things and budding to a virtuous life. It sends out healthy shoots of love toward God. It becomes clear to us that the Lord has specifically come to heal this woman and to give her life. And we can see that he has known her her thirst for God. In fact, he saw in her failed marriages and her, and her divorces a woman who was ultimately desperately searching for love. Oftentimes, our sins can be traced to an inner sense that we feel unloved. When a man falls into an addiction or alcohol abuse, it's often because they are trying to self-soothe. He doesn't sense love, so he turns to something that numbs the pain or fills that emptiness, so to speak. When a young woman doesn't feel attention or love, especially from her father, she tends to look left and right to find someone to give her that attention. This is psychology. We become so thirsty for such a deep love that sadly, we will almost throw ourselves to anything to anyone, to quench that thirst, no matter how destructive that situation is. But we see good news in all of this. Put simply, we're loved. We are loved. We are created for more than empty addictions. We are created more for than just endless hunger and endless thirst. Christ has created us and given us a tremendous, deep hunger so that nothing created could ever fill this void. So that we would desire to be filled with the infinite, the infinite love of God. St. John Chrysostom says that the Lord calls the Holy Spirit water in order to highlight the cleansing it does and the great refreshment it provides to those minds that receive it. He says, for it makes the willing soul like a kind of garden, thick with all kinds of fruitful and productive trees, allowing it neither to feel despondency nor the plots of Satan. It quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked one. He offered something precious, something that she didn't deserve. None of us deserve. And the fathers understand that the Samaritan woman is a symbol of the church. She symbolizes each one of us. Christ comes to her, and he comes to each one of us and offers what he offered her so many years ago, this great promise. So to conclude, we know that she was thirsty for the Spirit of God, and we can see this from her actions after the encounter, from the life that she lived afterwards, the repentance that happened. So what about each one of us? Does our lives demonstrate the thirst of the Holy Spirit? Does it demonstrate a hunger in doing the will of God? 
These are questions that we have to contemplate on. And here's the thing, God will not force himself on any one of us. He gives us according to our desire, but the deeper that you go, the more he will share of himself and his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit desires to fill you by his grace, to recharge you, to give you power to walk, to live a life according to the image and the likeness of God. What is needed from us is to direct our thirst to the right place. If we keep chasing empty, abandoned wells, we should not be surprised when we are left in a worse shape than we found them. So let us be faithful. Let us run to the well of our salvation, to our Lord Jesus Christ, who alone can bring us to fulfillment and the love of the, of the Holy Trinity. We cast away the other bitter waters, the waters that leave us to thirst again, the water that have stolen away our joy and our attention, and we turn to the one who gives us the sweet living water. Our Lord promised, and I'll leave you with this, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst forever. The water that I shall give him will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Yeah.